right. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We are taking this time on Sunday evenings, uh, preaching a series that we're calling Our Future Foretold. And it's one part, uh, sort of a three-part teaching integration that we're doing uh, for the next six months in our church, integrating our Sunday school time in a series entitled Our Future Hope with small group and a study that we're doing in the book of Daniel. And we'll see how Daniel intersects uh, more closely with uh, Matthew chapter 24 uh, next week. And then also uh, we'll be doing a book called The Blessed Hope by George Eldon Ladd during our small group time. And then on Sunday evenings, a series entitled Our Future Foretold. Or we'll be studying prophetic texts, uh, beginning with the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. So let me begin uh, this evening by reading the text, Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14. Uh, this is part two in the Olivet Discourse. There'll be many parts to come. And we want to work through this text together and uh, expand on what we began last week. So let's begin with the reading of the text, Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations... And then the end will come. Let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much, Lord, for this word. You're so gracious and merciful to us. And um, just your gracious condescension to share these things with us. We might understand them. We might understand what you are um, going to do. Lord, what will be the end of all these things, the sign of your coming. We praise you, Lord, that you've uh, cared for us in such a way that... You prepared us for these things, for what will happen, so that our hearts would not be troubled, and so that we would not, as you told the disciples, that we would not be made to stumble because you've told us beforehand. And we're grateful to you for that. Help us to understand. Lord, help us as we go through this series on eschatology. Lord, help us to diligently study your word, uh, to put these things together, Lord, and in all this, to honor you in our understanding of your word. And Spirit of God, we pray for help and give us understanding, give us wisdom as we study these things together. We love you and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24. Um, This is part two of our study of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And as we come to this text now again, Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 14 in particular, uh, it's Passover week in Jerusalem. Passover week in Jerusalem, thousands have packed themselves into the city, and the Lord and His disciples have retired to the western slope of the Mount of Olives for the evening to have fellowship and for the Lord to continue to instruct and to prepare His disciples for what is to come. So as they climb the Mount of Olives, and as the Temple Mount comes into view, uh, the stunning view of these impressive buildings prompt a critically important conversation where the Lord intends to prepare His disciples for what is soon to come. In what we are are considered to be parting words of of the Lord to His disciples, the Lord intends to prepare them for times of doubt, for times of fear and uncertainty. He wants to warn them ahead of time and steer them clear of error and deception. He wants to warn them to watch and to be ready. Don't be struggling in the ministry that I've called you to. Don't grow weary in doing well. Don't stop preaching the gospel. 
And he wants to encourage them that after having left, departing to the Father by means of his cross, that he will come back. And he encourages us through this text with the same facts. We're to be encouraged by these things too, amen? And these things are encouraged, encouraging to us as we study them. So in Matthew 24, verse 1, the Bible reads that Jesus went out, departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them in verse 2, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now in the context of the gospel accounts, also Mark's record and Luke's record, this proclamation of judgment, judgment upon the temple here specifically, comes immediately after Jesus Christ clears the temple of the wicked money changers. We looked at that last week. It comes after the Lord tells the parable of the wicked vine dressers who attempt to steal from the landowner and kill his son. We also looked at that last Lord's Day. And it comes after the Pharisees rob the poor widow of her last two mites. In other words, we see great injustice done uh, amongst the religious leaders in the temple. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes into Jerusalem and must clear the temple of all that wickedness. And after the proclamation of divine woes of judgment that we see in Matthew chapter 23 against the scribes and against the Pharisees, where Jesus has announced that the Jewish leaders have filled up the full measure of their guilt, and that their house, the temple essentially, would be left to them desolate, the Lord's statement here is both clear now and shocking to the disciples. The disciples understood this statement to mean specifically the destruction of the temple. They understood that to be the case. He was speaking here of the temple being destroyed, and that referring to God's judgment. They equated that with God's judgment. And... In the text, we see that the fulfillment of this prophecy would take place in just a few short years. The Lord's statement here, in verse 2, then prompts a question from His disciples. In verse 3, the Bible reads, Now as He sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of Your coming and of the end of the age? Essentially in verse 3, two questions are asked. The first question, when will these things be? The second question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, the disciples saw all of this, and this is important to understand. The disciples saw all of this as a complex of events. They see them as coincident realities coming at the same time. They believed that the temple would be destroyed and that Jesus would come back. Now remember... The disciples thought, we we looked at this when we worked through the Gospel of John, right? The disciples thought that Jesus is preaching, that His establishment of His kingdom, that the Lord's judgment, and that the restoration of Israel would all occur at the same time, and they would occur when the Messiah came, right? During His earthly ministry, at His first advent. Like the Old Testament prophets before them who spoke of the Messiah, they saw only a single coming comprised of a sequence of events. Now let me help us with that statement by looking at a text in the Old Testament. Turn with me to Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61. We have an example of this, exactly what we're speaking of, in the preaching of Isaiah the prophet, and a continuation of that in the preaching of our Lord in Luke. Let's look first at Isaiah chapter 61. And look at verse 1. Isaiah 61, 1. Here the Bible reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Right, now, keep your finger right there in Isaiah chapter 61 and flip over to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. During the synagogue service in Nazareth, recorded in Luke chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ read from this passage in Isaiah 61. And in his reading, he gave an indication that His coming would be in two parts. This would be a complex of events, not a single 
coming. There would be a coincident reality associated with His coming, not a single coming, if that makes sense. Look at Luke chapter 4 and look down beginning at verse 18. Verse 17. The Lord was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when He had opened the book, He found the place where it was written. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20. Then He closed the book. And he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Right? Now turn back to Isaiah chapter 61. If you notice, the Lord reading from this text in Isaiah 61 stops in the middle of verse 2. And it's an indication that there would be two stages or two parts to his coming, right? He omitted in verse 2 the phrase that reads, and the day of the vengeance of our God. After having finished at the middle of verse 2, he explains, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What the Lord implies there in his stopping is that there would be a delay, a delay between the first half of verse 2 and the second half of verse 2. Look at chapter 61 and look at verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, that's where the Lord stopped, what follows and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the beginning to seek and to save that which is lost. He does not come to judge. He will come later to judge. He will execute judgment on all the ungodliness, on all the ungodly, for all of their ungodly ways, right? As Jude says. He came during this time only to preach the gospel, to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, as the Lord then, back in Matthew chapter 24... As the Lord then answers the disciples' question in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, He will speak to them of a delay, of a delay, all right? And specifically with respect to the destruction of the temple in verse 2. Look with me with your finger in Matthew chapter 24. Turn with me to Luke chapter 21. And Luke here gives us some insight as to the events that the Lord is speaking of, and this delay. Right? Look at Luke chapter 21. And look with me beginning at verse 20. Verse 20. And Luke here adds helpful insight regarding this delay. Luke chapter 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies then know that its desolation is near. And we've talked about that before. We understand that the temple was destroyed, that Jerusalem fell to the Romans in A.D. 70. Right? Jerusalem was surrounded by the Romans, sacked by the Romans. Thousands were killed. The temple was razed to the ground. And we see this taking place in A.D. 70. When you see Jerusalem, verse 20, surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Remember Jesus Christ saying to those in the temple, your house has been left to you desolate, right? Verse 21, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Let's understand exactly what's going on there, what the Lord is saying by that statement. In other words, this would take place, this would take place beginning with the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. That's what Luke is referring to in verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, armies, then know that the temple's desolation is near. Right? Verse 20. Then we see this period of delay marked by persecution and ended, so to speak, in verse 24, by the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. 
referred to here as the trampling of Jerusalem, clearly continues until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Paul refers to this time period in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, where he explains that a blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, there is a time period when the Gentiles are coming into the kingdom. Right? And when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the end will come. Well, what time period are we familiar with where Gentiles are coming into the kingdom? It's the time period that we're in now, right? It's the church age when the gospel of the kingdom is, pre- is preached throughout the whole world. As the fullness of the Gentiles are coming in, then the end will come. Turn back with me now to Matthew chapter 24. Keep that understanding of Luke 21 in mind. The Lord describing this delay until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And I want you to see this back in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 14. This time clearly begins in the time of the disciples, anticipating the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, and then moves beyond that time to when the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles, comes in. The note references in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 4, note the references to this time of delay. Verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass... But the end is not yet. In other words, this period of delay is marked by false teaching. It's marked by deception. But the end is not yet. There's an inference there that this period of delay will be a substantial period of time. Look at verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And these are the beginnings of... Of sorrows. That word for sorrows there meaning birth pangs, right? And oftentimes the end coming is compared to or analogous to birth pangs, labor pains in childbirth, right? We're in a period of time where the earth, so to speak, Romans chapter 8, the earth, so to speak, is in labor in childbirth, right? Beginnings of sorrows. They begin slowly, they will increase in frequency and severity, just like birth pangs do. In other words, this time period will continue and worse and worse. There is every inference here that this will be a substantial period of time. And so the Lord says, don't be deceived. Don't be troubled. Right? Look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. This will be a time marked by persecution and tribulation. Did the disciples see a time like that in their day? Yes. Is that a time that we experience in our day? Yes. It's been going on throughout the church age, right? This time period marked by persecution, marked by tribulation, has continued through the church age. Look at verse 10. Then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Are these things currently taking place? Yes. Are they continuing to get worse and worse? Yes. Increasing in frequency, increasing in severity, just like birth pangs, right? They will continue to increase in frequency and severity until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and then the end will come. Look at verse 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, that certainly sounds like our day, doesn't it? The love of many will grow cold. That also sounds like our day, doesn't it? Verse 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. There's the inference there that this is a lengthy period of time, right? through which the disciples must persevere to the end in order to be saved. The end is not yet. Look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. When does that take place? It takes place in the preaching of the gospel by the church in the age we're currently in. Right? This is the preaching of the gospel by the church. The gospel of the kingdom is being preached by the church in all the world as a witness to all the nations. The gospel is still being preached, right? We remember us singing a while back a hymn entitled The Unfinished Task. Still an unfinished task, isn't it? 
the gospel must still be preached. There are plenty of places where we need to preach the gospel. And we need to labor to that end. This is the time period in which the gospel is preached. This is the time period in which that persecution is ramping up. This is the time period in which we're marked by deception, marked by false teaching. It's evident all around us, right? This is describing this time period of the church. And when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then the end will come. Right? This is what the church is doing. They're preaching the gospel. Now, why is this delay? If you look both in Luke chapter 21, and if you look at Matthew chapter 24, why is this delay important to note? The delay is important to note because we're currently in the period of delay. Right? We're currently in that time. Verses 4 through 14, Matthew chapter 24, are referring to a time of tribulation. It's a time of tribulation that we are currently in. We're currently experiencing. We're currently going through this time. Now note the chronology with me that is clearly referenced in the text. First, you have the destruction of the temple. Now that took place in AD 70 when it was raised to the ground by the Romans. Right? Well, the text is not speaking of, and what you see absolutely no indication in the text of, is a future temple that must be rebuilt in order for it to be destroyed again. Right? This took place in A.D. 70 when the, the Romans sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Second point in our chronology. Notice that there is a delay, a period of time, where persecution, tribulation, and disorder ramp up grow worse and worse. Evil men and imposters grow what? Worse and worse. Until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. There is a time, a delay, a period of tribulation that is ramping up like birth pangs. The Lord has said in His day, this was the beginning of sorrows. Those sorrows have continued and those sorrows grow worse and worse and worse in our day. Then the third point of the chronology, and then, the Lord says, the end will come. Then the end will come. And note with me again. Nothing in the text would lead us to believe that these events are still future. Everything in the text points to the fact that these events are current. Right? Current for both the disciples and current for you and I. Those events began in the day of the Lord and they continue in our day as part of this delay that's referenced by the Lord in Matthew 24. Next... Nothing in the text points to a future temple that must be rebuilt and then destroyed again. Everything points in the text to the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Right? Very clear from the text, the temple was actually destroyed in A.D. 70. And, thirdly, in fact, we are in the time of the Gentiles, according to Paul. A blindness in part, Romans 11.25, a blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. We are in that period of time when the Lord is gathering His elect from the four corners of the earth. The gospel is being preached all over the world, and the Gentiles are coming into the kingdom. We're in that age. This is an age of tribulation. Now let's look at each of those tribulation marks beginning in verse 4. Look at verse 4. What are each of those tribulation marks, and how do they apply in our day? Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, First, take heed that no one deceive you. We live in a day and age of almost unimaginable deception. The false teaching, the error that people will believe, hang their soul on, rest their faith in, is... Almost unimaginable, almost unbelievable. It's absurd. Many deceivers are among us. Many people are deceived. Verse 5, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Many will come in my name. I'm shocked at how many come in his name. Gullible people are only too willing to heed. I was witnessing to a Mormon not long ago, and I just stopped the conversation about halfway through and said to him, you are willing to trust your eternal soul to a man, Joseph Smith. Him alone, witnessing the Book of Mormon, so to speak, witnessing the translation of the plates, and you're willing to trust your eternal soul to that man, a man, an unjust man, 
at that. Those that would follow Charles, Charles Taze Russell, Ellen G. White, the cults today. When people don't trust the Lord Jesus Christ, when they refuse to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll accept almost anything to fill that vacuum. They'll follow almost any deceiver. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John says, Little children, it is the last hour. You know, there are those who would say that the Lord's use of birth pain language simply couldn't refer to this age because it's too long for birth pains. Birth pains would come at the very end, and all those events of Matthew 24 are still future. John here, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says, Little children, it is the last hour. These are the appropriate days for birth pangs. We see that, don't we? We see it ramping up. John says, little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. We are in an age of deception. We are in an age of tribulation. John says, it's by this which we now know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Many antichrists have come. And how many in our day and age will only too readily trust their eternal soul to these lying charlatans? They are a dime a dozen. Turn on your TV, and you're going to find one. <laughs> However, there are many for whom their claim goes farther. They claim to be the Messiah himself. There were false Christs that came before the Lord Jesus Christ, and there have been other false Christs who have come since the Lord Jesus Christ. And as time goes by, as the birth pangs, the beginnings of sorrows increase, their numbers and their influence will increase. They will ramp up, they will multiply, and they will, they will multiply their deceptions, and they will multiply the number of people deceived by them. Many come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Look at verse 6. And you will hear, and the word there means be hearing. You'll be hearing of wars, rumors of wars. But see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The Lord Jesus Christ, in his discussion with his disciples in the upper room discourse in John chapter 16, told them what would happen so that they would know when those events came to pass, they would remember that the Lord Jesus Christ told them of them so that they would not be made to stumble. The Lord gives us the same loving, gracious, kind word here. He tells us these things ahead of time so that we are not troubled, so that we know these things are revealed to us. They're not hidden any longer. These things are not mysterious. These things are revealed to us so that we can heed them and that we would not be troubled. The Lord says, see that you are not troubled. All these things, wars and rumors of wars, must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Another time marker indicating that there is a long period of time here during this delay. Actual physical wars will break loose all over the world. Is that not the case today? There are conflicts constantly. We're involved in most of them, it seems. Conflicts all the time. Rumors of wars, right? Cold wars. Cyber wars, something that is new to our day and age, these rumors of wars. It's the crazy conflict in Cuba where our citizens were assaulted with some weird sonic, right? It's like the things like that taking place, cold wars, rumors of wars, economic conflicts, political struggles. The Lord says in the midst of all these things that will ramp up and will grow worse and worse, He says, do not fear. All these things must take place, must come to pass, but the end is not yet. All these, during this time period, are definitive evidence that God's plan is coming to fruition, right? We can trust as we witness these things, as we consider prophecy in Scripture, as we consider through the book of Daniel, how that prophecy came literally true, how it was fulfilled, and how there is still God's kingdom remaining. Right? We can see how that prophecy was fulfilled, and we understand that those prophecies fulfilled point to the fact that future prophecies will also be fulfilled in the same way. We can look at these events, we can look at this evidence, and we can rest Take joy and comfort in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, having said these things, they will come to pass. These are def definitive evidence that God's sovereign plan is coming to fruition. God is in sovereign control. Look at verse 7. 
For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. If you look quickly at Romans chapter 8, even the creation gets involved in the birth pangs, right? Even the creation is groaning about this. Look at verse 22, Romans chapter 8, verse 22. For we know, Paul says, that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. There's that word, that reference again to birth pangs. This is in Paul's language, in Paul's day. These things are being referred to. It's as if the entire created order is awaiting the redemption of the sons of glory. Right? The entire created order groaning with birth pangs awaiting the end. Back in Matthew chapter 24, the Lord describes all this in verse 8 as the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of birth pangs. The whole of church history are labor pains. The whole of church is history is referring to labor pains. From Advent to Advent, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ, it has begun and it will continue. Verses 4 through 14 describe that period of time for us. Look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. That certainly happened in the time of the disciples. It has happened throughout church history. It continues to happen today. How long, how long will it be before one of us preaching in the park against homosexuality is arrested? How long will it be? We just had one of our brothers arrested a few weeks ago from what I understand, or arrested, went to trial, went to court for preaching the gospel and was found guilty of causing a public dis disturbance and has a record now. It's the first one that I've heard of in our country that was found guilty in a court of law. His right to preach the gospel. So, not long. And how long before you're standing on a public sidewalk preaching against abortion before you're arrested? For offending someone. How long can we take a stand against calling George Sally and expect that we're going to survive that in the courts? Not long. Not long. If you do that today, you're called a bigot. It won't be long before bigotry is outlawed and comes with a sentence. Verse 10. Many will be offended. Many will betray one another and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. We see all these things going on today. Seed form, they're beginning. They are continuing to ramp up. They will continue to ramp up. The birth pangs will continue until the end comes. Verse 12, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's our response to these things, right? As we consider the Lord's words in Matthew chapter 24, His explanation of what will take place during this time, our responsibility is to endure in persevering faith to the end and be saved. Right? We have a responsibility. We have a ministry. We're to preach the gospel. During this time, the gospel of the kingdom, look at verse 14, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. But whose responsibility is it to preach the gospel in all the world as a witness to all the nations? That's the responsibility of you and I in the church. Our responsibility during this time is to serve the Lord Christ. Our responsibility during this time is to obey Him in the Great Commission, making disciples, preaching the gospel, evangelizing the lost. As we preach the gospel, as we take a stand for truth and righteousness in this perverse generation, we are not greater than our Master. If they persecuted Him, they will certainly persecute us. If they hated Him, they will certainly hate us. We're to preach this gospel in this age to all the world as a witness to all the nations. We're to do that and endure in persevering faithfulness to the end. And then the end will come. We need to be ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? If we're alive at that time, there will be many who will be martyred for their faith. 
We need to be ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even now, ready to die to self to preach the kingdom. We need to trust the Lord. Not be troubled by these things. Not to be concerned by these things. To rejoice in these things, right? The sovereign God is in control of all things whatsoever that come to pass. We're to rejoice in Him during this time, knowing that those birth pangs are increasing. And soon the end will come. Soon the end will come. None of us is exempt from tribulation. We're in a period of tribulation now. That tribulation will ramp up, and we'll see beginning next week, followed by a great tribulation. None of us is exempt from tribulation. The Lord's people have never been exempt from tribulation. They've suffered tribulation through all of biblical history. That tribulation is coming. We must endure to the end and be saved. Don't let your heart be troubled. Endure to the end. Keep the faith, right? Keep the faith. Be faithful. In season, out of season. Preach the word. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. May the Lord be praised. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for uh, this text. I thank you for the clarity of it, Lord. Uh, Just grateful to you for how clear, how straightforward the text is and how we can rejoice in its truths, uh, how we can um, just praise you for your sovereign control over all things, trust you for everything that comes to pass, rest in you for the strength and enablement that we need to endure. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that one day soon, You will return. Our faith will become sight. You will rule and reign with your saints forever. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 